Yeah, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so I guess there's been a lot of work in differential privacy in the last decade and what I'll try to do today is uh, sort of give you a high level overview of uh, some of the techniques and some of the paradigms that go into designing differentially private algorithms. Uh, and I guess in our talk is not enough to cover all of the stuff, so I'll kind of pick and choose a few of my uh, favorite examples and paradigms uh, and just uh, mention some of the others. Uh, okay, so in case some of you missed the uh, first few talks, here's the differential privacy definition uh, that we'll be using. Uh, for the most part, we'll be talking about epsilon delta differential privacy. Uh, we'll say two databases, D and D prime are neighbors if uh, they differ in the input of one person. Uh, and I'll use uh, small d and d prime for databases. Uh, and I guess differential privacy, as we know, said, says that uh, these two distributions of the algorithm's output are very close uh, in a multiplicative sense. Uh, we'll also be using composition, uh, which Guy talk talked about. And I guess morally, what we'll be using is the fact that if you run T differentially private algorithms, each of which is epsilon differentially private, uh, then the sum total is something like epsilon times square root of T differentially private. Okay, so let me kind of uh, just start with uh, where we'll end the talk and what one of the things we'll be going towards is trying to design an end-to-end -end machine learning algorithm uh, for some kind of a classification task. So in particular, I'll be looking at uh, uh, training a classifier to classify images. So, so this is a very famous data set known as the MNIST data set. Uh, so it's a data set of handwritten digits. It actually comes from, uh, I think, Census Bureau employees. Uh, and the label data set contains about 50,000 images, uh, each of, so about uh, 5,000 zeros, 5,000 ones, and so on. And uh, the goal is to look at the image, which is a 28 by 28 uh, bitmap, and figure out what the digit is. Okay. Uh, good, so we'll get there, but let's start with something much simpler. So let's look at a very simple problem uh, of picking a good date for an event. So imagine you want to organize an event, say a conference like this one. Uh, you have some range of feasible dates, and you know the conference center availability. Uh, these data, these parts of the input are public, they are known, not sensitive. Uh, in addition, you have, for each attendee, access to their calendar uh, given to you in a, uh, in a private fashion. So you don't want to release their, uh, their calendars that may look like this, uh, but you want to find a date when most of the people can make it. Right? So imagine, in this toy example, there are eight people, uh, person H can only make it on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and is busy on the remaining four days, um, and so on. Right? And your goal is to find a date when most people are available. So to start with, uh, what does an algorithm for such a problem looks, look like? So at a high level, an algorithm will take the data, process it in some way, and come up with an answer. So one way to, you could write an algorithm to solve this problem is to go over all the feasible dates and if the conference center is not available on that date, you kind of ignore that date, set the count to zero. Uh, for every other date, you count how many people are available on this date. Uh, and then you have an array of numbers containing kind of the number of people that can make it on each date. Uh, you look at the largest entry uh, in this array, and the argmax gives you the date that has uh, the largest availability. Okay, so in this example, most of my algorithm actually does not look at the private data. So here I have colored the private data in red, uh, the rest of the data in blue. Uh, there's only one step in the algorithm where I, ex where I access private data. 
So if I want to make this whole algorithm differentially private, uh, I need to make sure that I do something to this step of the algorithm so that this step does not release private information. Uh, I could do something like this. I could uh, use some sanitization mechanism uh, just on this step of the algorithm. That would be one way to make it differentially private. Or I could say, well, this whole algorithm um, is, I can think of the whole algorithm as one big data access and sanitize the whole algorithm at once. Right? Or in some cases, maybe I want to uh, take a smaller subset of this algorithm, maybe I just sanitize this code block. And in differentially private algorithm design, such choices make a difference because uh, uh, it's, it is often the case, in fact, as, a, as in this example, that sanitizing a larger block is actually, can be done much more efficiently in terms of the amount of uh, error we incur than, would ha than what would happen if we were to just sanitize each block individually. Good, so I guess in general, to design a differentially private algorithm, what we will do is we will write it down. We'll write down an algorithm, we'll figure out which steps access private data, and then make sure that each access to private data is covered by a sanitizer, either at, either at an individual level or at a more aggregate level. Okay, so before we can do that, uh, let's think about, uh, so let me tell you something, uh, tell you about some simple sanitization algorithms, uh, some primitives which uh, can sanitize kind of simple accesses to data. So, so here's the first sanitizer that we, that I guess uh, Guy already talked about. Uh, this would be the Laplacian mechanism. Uh, if I want to sanitize a function such as the number of people in the database that are available on a certain date, uh, the Laplacian mechanism basically says compute the correct answer, and just add noise to it, drawn from this distribution. Uh, this is the Laplacian distribution. Uh, its density falls off exponentially in both directions. Uh, it looks like this. Uh, why is this differentially private? So, it's a great question. Uh, <laughs> A uh, number of answers. First, it's very, very easy to prove the differential privacy of this mechanism. Uh, second, if you actually define differential privacy as your goal, then for such a query, this algorithm is provably the best one in a decision theoretic sense. Uh, this is a result of uh, Rough Garden and Sundarajan. Uh, but I guess, I think the first answer, uh, you will see very shortly why it's so nice. Uh, so note that this function f has the property that if I were to enter the database, if I'm in the red database and not in the orange one, the answer can change by at most one. It's either the same or different by at most one. So on neighboring databases, f and f, f of d and f of d prime differ by at most one. So this mechanism in the red universe is sampling from this red distribution on the in an, on an adjacent database, it may be sampling from this orange distribution. Uh, and here's the nice part about the Laplacian mechanism. If you compute the density at any point, uh, it's proportional to exponential in the distance from the mean. Uh, the means differ by at most one. So for any single point y, uh, this argument shows that these two densities are within an e to the epsilon of each other. And subject to that constraint, it actually falls the fastest, which is why we, it gives you the least amount of uh, possible error. Good, so now we have a mechanism for uh, sanitizing account, but let's look closely at the proof. What did we use in the proof? The only thing we used was that this function changes by at most one between adjacent databases. Right? And that's a property that's true not just for counts, but for a much larger class of functions. Uh, that we call sensitivity one functions. And I guess the same proof that I showed you 
establishes that for any sensitivity one function, uh, this mechanism gives you differential privacy. Uh, how large is the noise that you add? Uh, this Laplace distribution has the noise mean, uh, the magnitude of the noise is expected to be about one over epsilon. So it's adding a very small amount of noise. Uh, if you have a large database where you expect the answer to be something uh, much larger than one over epsilon, this is a negligible amount of noise. Uh, also, I guess this is kind of clear. If instead of sensitivity one, I have sensitivity s for some larger number s, I would scale up the noise by a factor of s and get the same differential privacy guarantee. Good. So this is the Laplacian mechanism. Uh, the second primitive I'll talk about is, uh, is the Gaussian mechanism, which looks very similar. Uh, but instead of adding uh, Laplacian noise, we add Gaussian noise of a suitable, uh, uh, suitable variance. And for a suitable choice of sigma, this satisfies epsilon delta differential privacy. Uh, the Gaussian is nice. We all uh, like the Gaussian distribution for various reasons. Uh, it doesn't have the, have the, the exact uh, e to the epsilon differential privacy, but with high probability, as long as you are in the middle of the distribution, you do get uh, a small change in, uh, uh, in uh, you get a very small like privacy loss. Uh, so unless you are in the tails, you get a good privacy guarantee. Uh, moreover, actually, the other nice thing about the Gaussian is that these mechanisms compose very well. So uh, a guy talked about uh, concentrated differential privacy, which kind of, I guess, uh, epitomizes, uh, which is, uh, for which I guess the Gaussian mechanism is a lead example. Uh, and in fact, you can show other nice properties of the Gaussian mechanism, and we'll get to some of them uh, later in the talk. Uh, but here's another really nice property of the Gaussian mechanism. Imagine now that the function you care about is not a scalar function, is not one real value, but a vector function. It's a bunch of real values. So the function output is a vector in some high dimensional space. If you have the property that the effect of any one individual on the function output has Euclidean norm at most one, so I can define the sensitivity in terms of the Euclidean distance now. Then just adding Gaussian noise from the appropriate high dimensional uh, distribution uh, gives me differential privacy. Right, so in this case, uh, in two dimensions, I'll be drawing from some such distribution. Uh, going to an adjacent database, I could uh, sample from a nearby distribution. Uh, these are still very close. Good, so now we have two nice uh, primitives to output counts. Uh, let me talk about uh, one more, which applies to a slightly different setting uh, that Cynthia alluded to. So sometimes you have queries where the answer is either not a real number or as a real number, it doesn't make sense to add noise to it, such as a price to sell an item at. Uh, or the adding noise may, uh, if you wanted to add noise, you'll have to add a very large amount of noise because the sensitivity of this function is actually large. Right, so think of the function that we talked about, uh, which is the best day for holding an event. Uh, I can enter or leave the database and change the best date from uh, Monday to Friday. Right, so if you were to add noise to that quantity, you would get essentially complete uh, you might as well just output a random date at that point. Uh, so here's a different mechanism that works in such a setting. Uh, we'll assume that you have a set K of options. Uh, for now, think of K as a finite set. And you have some score function, which tells you how good is a specific outcome K on a database T. So for example, uh, Q of the database and a certain date could be the number of people that can attend on that date. Okay. Uh, 
we'll assume that this core function is insensitive. It can change by at most one between uh, adjacent databases. Uh, and for example, the function we talked about, the number of people that can attend on a certain date is insensitive. In this case, uh, the exponential mechanism is the following simple mechanism. It says, uh, pick an element of this uh, set of candidates randomly with probability proportional to exponential in the score function. So you take your score function, you exponentiate it, multiply it by epsilon, uh, and that gives you a, convert that to a, normalize that to a distribution and sample from it. Uh, it's not very hard to show, and I'm sure if I gave you two minutes, all of you could prove it, that this satisfies uh, two epsilon differential privacy. Uh, you can also prove uh, strong utility bounds about this algorithm. Uh, you can show that the, since Q is the function we are trying to maximize, you can show that the Q function of the output of this mechanism is almost as good as the best possible up to an additive error of about log k over epsilon. Uh, so when, uh, I guess this k should really be uh, the cardinality of capital K, it's not, uh, uh, it's not index. Uh, good, and I, in fact, you can generalize this mechanism to cases where your output space is not finite, but uh, say uncountable. Uh, and similar uh, analogous uh, utility results continue to hold in that setting. Good, so any questions about these uh, primitives? Great, okay, so now we have these three primitives, uh, uh, these three sanitization mechanisms. Uh, we'll now try to show how you can use them to do more complex tasks. Right, so you could imagine taking your favorite algorithm uh, and every time you access the data, you add, uh, add an appropriate sanitizer. And that is one way to solve the problem. It won't necessarily give you the best possible algorithm for, those same, for that problem. In the same way that uh, the first algorithm you think of for a non-private problem is, is not the best one, right? So, I guess in general, there's no standard way of figuring out what is the best algorithm for a certain task. Uh, but what we do have in algorithm design is a set of uh, kind of paradigms, if you may, which apply to a large class of settings. So in classical algorithm design, we have greedy and dynamic programming. Uh, in combinatorial optimization, we have linear programming and semi-definite programming. Uh, and I guess I'll try to uh, so I guess differential private algorithm design is still a rather young field, but I'll try to define some paradigms that kind of seem to be widely applicable. Good. Uh, so let's go back to our example that we saw, that, it's that of picking a good date. Uh, so here's one algorithm for this problem that I'm, I expect many of you have already thought of. You can notice that this whole problem that I'm trying to solve is the problem of computing an argmax of an insensitive function. Right? The exponential mechanism is designed to solve exactly this problem. It's a sanitizer that exactly sanitizes the argmax. So I can just apply the exponential mechanism to this whole computation. Uh, in pictures, what you would do is uh, you would kind of count for each day how many people are available uh, and sample from the distribution defined by an exponential in this quantity. Uh, so it's kind of easy to see that you are unlikely to pick Monday because it's way below the best possible. Uh, you would likely uh, pick one of Wednesday or Thursday if you were to run the exponential mechanism on this one. Right. So I guess this is an example of uh, what I would call the just add noise paradigm. So this is the kind of the simplest thing you can do. You look at the whole function you're trying to compute and you ask, is this function insensitive? Is, or can my, one of my primitives just directly apply to this function? And uh, somewhat surprisingly, this actually already works in a large number of settings. So 
If you want to release some simple statistics, uh, as Guy talked about briefly, uh, just adding noise actually works very well. Uh, for some combinatorial problems like finding near min cuts in a graph, this approach actually works. Uh, sometimes it takes a lot more work to prove that something like this works. So if you want to do gradient descent or even stochastic gradient descent for, a, for minimizing a strongly convex objective, uh, with some work you can show that this objective, uh, that this algorithm runs stochastic gradient descent for t steps actually has very low sensitivity. Uh, and uh, using this, you can actually design an algorithm which says just run your stochastic gradient descent and then add noise to the final answer. It actually gives very uh, uh, near optimal results for this problem. Okay, so let me now move to a problem where just this approach, this greedy doesn't quite work. Uh, so I'll talk about the principal component analysis problem. This is the problem of kind of taking your high dimensional data and figuring out the important direction, removing the noise directions from your data. Uh, so I guess PCA is just a fancy word for the simple task of finding directions in your high dimensional data where the interesting stuff happens. So, uh, you can think of each of your MNIST digits as a, so it's a 28 by 28 image. You can think of it as a 784 dimensional vector. And that's a very high dimensional vector to work with, so you may want to actually reduce dimension uh, to kind of reduce, remove the noise. And PCA is one standard way of doing it. Uh, so I'll formalize the problem as follows. You get a number k, this is your target dimension after the projection. Uh, and you have this set of vectors uh, in R to the M, so M in this case is 784. I'll assume that each of these vectors has norm at most one. And I want to output a subspace, a k-dimensional subspace, which contains all the interesting stuff. And formally, uh, we define that as, you want to define this projection such that the projected vectors have as large an average squared norm as possible. Right? So if you were to actually run the subroutine on the SEMNIST data set, uh, it actually does something reasonable. Uh, you get a picture like this. So each of these colors represents one class. So I think these are all the zeros, these reds are all the ones. And you can already see that removing the noise just doing this simple two-dimensional PCA already somewhat separates uh, the data. And if you actually go from two to somewhat higher dimensions, uh, then the structure becomes even clearer. Each of these colors separate into clusters if you go to, some, to a slightly higher dimensional space. Uh, so this is actually a very widely used uh, tool in, uh, in data analysis. Uh, there's a lot of work in this problem uh, for the simple reason that there is uh, there's a lot of ways you could go about trying to solve this problem with differential privacy. Uh, note that if you just try to solve it in the most direct way, which is to add noise, it just doesn't work. So the sensitivity of this function, so first of all, the object you're outputting is a projection, it's a matrix. This has very high sensitivity. Even if you look at entries of the matrix, it's easy to come up with settings where you need to add a lot of noise to these entries to get privacy, and at that point, you might as well just output a random subspace. Uh, so I guess you need to do something different. Uh, and I guess I'll describe an algorithm that's actually very simple in hindsight, uh, but works very well. Okay, so how do you solve this problem uh, if you didn't worry about privacy? So let's arrange our vectors, uh, V1 through Vk, V1 through Vn, in a matrix, where each vi is a row of the matrix. And you can show, this is kind of a standard fact in linear algebra, uh, that the optimal projection is given by the top k eigenvectors of this matrix. This is the covariance matrix of my data. Uh, it's the sum over all my vectors of the outer product of the vector with itself.
So this matrix C is an M by M dimensional, M by M matrix where M is the number of features I have, it's the number of dimensions. Uh, so if I just wanted to solve this problem non-privately, this is what I would do. Uh, or this is what I could do. This is probably not what I would do if I just wanted to solve it non-privately, but uh, but this is what you could do. You could actually compute this covariance matrix and then compute its eigenvectors and output the top k of those. Right. So what we'll try to do is we'll try to look at this view of the algorithm and make this differentially private. Uh, and here's this kind of uh, interesting fact, oh, sorry. Let's look at this matrix C. This is a M by M matrix, but let me look at it in a slightly strange way. Let me actually flatten it out into an M squared dimensional vector. Right. This function that takes my database uh, V1 through Vn, computes the covariance and flattens it this function has L2 sensitivity one. So what I can do now that we know this uh, fact, and this actually, f this is not a difficult fact to prove, uh, uh, but once we have this fact, you can actually just sanitize this computation. We know how to sanitize output of a vector by just adding Gaussian noise, uh, and that gives us an algorithm for uh, differentially private uh, principal component analysis. Interestingly, uh, you can prove very strong error bounds for this algorithm. So if this is the objective we were trying to optimize, you can show that this objective function value for the output of this algorithm is actually very close uh, to the best possible. And in fact, how much you lose is actually optimal. So if you want a differentially private algorithm, uh, this is kind of the optimal algorithm in terms of this objective. And I guess the proof for that uh, uses tools that uh, John will talk, to talk about later today. Uh, great, and actually this algorithm is also nice in other ways. It gives you bet good uh, data dependent guarantees if you're uh, uh, if your matrix has kind of fast decay eigen, eigenvalues, uh, which is often the case, uh, then at, then the utility guarantees are even better than uh, those suggested by the uh, in the worst case. So, I guess this was an example uh, of what I would call the noise of the right object or right objects paradigm. So here you take your uh, non-private, you fig find the right non-private algorithm for your problem, uh, figure out which steps effect, uh, are affected by the data, uh, and make sure that you sanitize those by carefully choosing uh, uh, the appropriate sanitization method. Uh, and I guess the example I gave you is one of the simpler ones. There's actually, uh, you can do a lot more in interesting stuff using this approach. You can uh, uh, build recommendation systems uh, that are differentially private. Uh, you can do uh, you can do gradient descent, uh, as uh, I will actually talk about later uh, in the talk. Uh, you can solve the set cover problem using this approach uh, in a differentially private way, and, and a lot of other things. Okay, so the next example I want to talk about is, I guess, one of my uh, uh, favorite set of queries uh, that uh, Guy already talked about. So let's return to the counting query. So the count query is essentially given by some function, P, which maps one database element, one person, to a number between zero and one, and your goal is to compute the total value of P summed over all the people in the database, right? So I want to compute the sum of evaluations of P over all people in my database. And this is a query that we all know how to answer at this point. 
This is a simple sensitivity one query because I can only change uh, the sum by at most one. Uh, so you can add Gaussian noise or Laplacian noise uh, to actually output this query. Okay, let's make this a little more interesting. Suppose I have not one query, but k of these queries. So to solve this one, you could actually answer each one of them and use a composition theorem, or you can take a different view and say, well, this whole set of k answers is actually one k-dimensional vector. So each person, uh, I have this function, uh, I guess, bold p now, which maps a database element to a point in zero, one to the k. And I'm just asking for the sums of these vectors over all people. Right, so now this is a vector query. Uh, the L2 sensitivity of this vector query is at most square root of k, because the norm of uh, any point in this, uh, in this hypercube is at most square root k. So I could use the Gaussian mechanism uh, to get, uh, get a square root k error uh, answer to all of these count queries. So it's natural to ask at this point, is this the best we can do? Can we do better? Right? And in fact, this question was asked even before there was differential privacy uh, and answered in the negative. So Dinur and Nisim showed that in general, if you have a set of k queries, you do need to add square root k noise. And in fact, uh, the proof of that fact actually uh, comes from discrepancy theory. Okay, but then you can ask, well, uh, is this all there is? I mean, is, can we actually, is there any hope of doing better? And maybe we can't do better for every set of queries because there's a lower bound, but maybe for specific set of queries, maybe the queries we care about are actually easier. So let's look at a simple set of queries. Suppose all the k queries are all exactly the same. I ask the same question over and over and over again. Does this need square root k error? No, right? I mean, I can answer the first query using differential privacy, uh, and this part accesses the data, and then for the, all the other questions, I can use the post-processing property of differential privacy and just copy my previous answer from the first uh, answer. So clearly there are queries which are easier, right? I can answer in some cases k queries with noise much less than square root k, with noise order one. And so what's going on? What's going on is that there are some dependencies between the answers to these queries. Uh, and in this case, we found a simple way to exploit those dependencies. And you can ask in general, uh, what sets of queries have dependencies? Can we answer, can we use those dependencies to get better answers to queries? Uh, and the answer to that, uh, as I'll kind of uh, hand wave a little bit, is actually yes. So you can actually use the dependencies uh, to, to do better for, for many queries. In fact, for any set of queries, you can ask the question, what's the best I can do for this set of queries? And how well you can do actually depends on the geometry of the set of queries. So let me define a convex body. So this is a set K, which is the set of all possible answers I can get on any database. Right? So this is the point, uh, this is a point in R to the K, in fact in zero, one to the K, uh, which, will be result, which will result if I apply P to myself, uh, this could be the point that I get uh, when applying P to guy and so on. So I can consider the set of all possible answers I could get on any database element uh, and look at the convex hull of that. So what is this set K in the simple case that I talked about when all the queries are the same? Well, when all the queries are the same, uh, the answer P lies along the line in the all ones direction. Uh, 
So this convex body K is really degenerate. It's just a line segment from all zeros to all ones. Uh, and in general, you can define this convex body for any set of queries. And what you can show is that, okay, so the Gaussian mechanism corresponds to saying, I will take this convex body, uh, I'll add noise from a Gaussian, which is kind of a, a ball. And the radius of that Gaussian, the size of that ball, uh, depends on how long each of these vectors is. That's the L2 sensitivity. And in that case, uh, in this case, the L2 sensitivity was square root of k. So I'll take a ball that contains k and add noise according to that. In general, I want to, to define a differentially private algorithm, I need to make sure that uh, uh, changes in the answer by an amount k in a vector sense are hidden, right? Because this is how much I personally can change the answer. This is sort of the sense, the vector sensitivity uh, of this query. And it turns out it's therefore not hard to see that it's actually enough to add noise according to a Gaussian whose covariance is some ellipse that contains k. Right, so I can tailor the noise I'm going to add according to the geometry of this convex body k. And then the problem reduces to find the best possible uh, ellipsoid, which will give me the least possible error. And it turns out you can actually uh, answer that question. Uh, so the upper bound uses uh, some kind of deep results in uh, convex geometry, but you can actually construct uh, essentially the best possible uh, mechanism uh, for any set of queries. And as I mentioned, the the lower bound, the lower bound of root k, and in fact, it's uh, generalization to arbitrary sets of queries, uh, comes from discrepancy theory. So it actually depends on uh, some notion of discrepancy of this convex body k. And I guess what was surprising is that the upper bounds you get from these geometric techniques and the lower bounds you get from these uh, combinatorial discrepancy techniques actually match up to polyrhogismic vectors on a instance by instance basis. So for every single k, the upper bound you get is within a polylog factor of the lower bound you get. And this actually led to a somewhat surprising connection between discrepancy theory and geometry, uh, which can be kind of succinctly stated as uh, uh, the following statement. Uh, I don't expect you to uh, know what either of these two quantities is, but uh, it did lead to kind of uh, I guess it did lead to an important result in discrepancy theory, even if you didn't care about privacy. Okay, uh, so that was a bit of a digression, but let's return to count queries for a little uh, while more. Uh, so I talked about count queries where the queries themselves are dependent. Uh, another setting where you have some dependencies is when I'm asking a lot more queries, then there are people in the database. And in this case, the dependencies between the answers are for different kind. They aren't really uh, these geometric uh, dependencies. They come from kind of a VC dimension type argument. And in fact, uh, uh, Blum, Liggett, and Roth, and uh, in further work, Hart and Rothblum showed that in fact, you can exploit these kinds of dependencies as well and get much less noise than you would get from just using the Gaussian mechanism. Uh, and I guess here is a, an alternate way to get the same kinds of results, uh, which is hopefully much uh, simpler to see. So notice that I said K is the answer you could get from one person. Uh, so the answer to this query, which is just summing up these values over n people, lies in this convex body n times k. This is something I know in advance. Uh, so what I can do is the following. I can take the correct answer, sanitize it by adding Gaussian noise, but now, more often than not, I'll get a point which is outside this polytope where I know the correct 
point to be, the correct set of answers to be. Uh, so I can correct for that. I can say, well, this is what the mechanism says the answer is, but I know the answer should belong to this, so let me project back. Let me find the point inside n, sub n, n times k, which is closest to uh, the output noisy answer. And the surprising fact from high dimensional statistics is that the distance between these two points is a lot smaller than this thing. The projection of the noise to the polytope is actually asymptotically smaller by exactly the right factor so that we get noise which is not square root of k but square root of n times polylog. So I guess both of these are examples of using additional information I have about the queries or the database to post-process the answers I get from a differentially private algorithm. Right? And this is actually a paradigm that's useful in a lot of other settings as well, where you run your differentially private algorithm, it gives you noisy answers, you expect the correct answer to satisfy some constraints. The noisy answers don't, so you force them to. And in the process, you actually reduce the noise. You remove uh, a lot of the noise. And this actually is uh, useful for a lot of settings. It can be used in Bayesian inference. Uh, uh, it can be used to release graph statistics, such as the degree distribution, uh, and so on. A closely related, at least syntactically, paradigm uh, is this one that I won't give an example of, uh, but this is what I call use available information to pre-process your queries rather than post-processing them. So in some settings, you have a query uh, and you know something about the database. So you know, for example, that the graphs you care about are all low degree graphs or the distribution that you care about is a nice continuous uh, unimodal distribution um, the query that you care about can have very large sensitivity in the worst case, but can have very small sensitivity on the graphs you care about. So if you want to count the number of triangles in the graph, a common task in uh, social graph analysis, uh, in general, one person can change the number of triangles by, by a lot, but in a low degree graph, you can't affect this number by too much. So what this paradigm says is, Let's change the query to a low sensitivity query, which agrees with the query I care about on the graphs that I care about. Right, so here I'm pre-processing the query based on information about the database, uh, and this actually turns out to be uh, extremely useful in, uh, in computing properties of graphs, uh, and I guess the proposed test release framework of Quark and Lie is also an instance of uh, this kind of uh, uh, pre-processing. Good. So let me now return to the problem I kind of started the talk with, which was learning a classifier for MNIST. So I'll formalize this problem a little bit more. Uh, now I'll take as input an architecture for a neural network. Uh, uh, don't worry too much about what exactly this is. Uh, think of this as sort of uh, defining a class of classifiers that I care about. I could care about linear classifiers or somewhat more complex classifiers. Uh, and now my goal is to learn parameters of this model. So in case of a linear classifier, I want to figure out which hyperplane is the best classifier between two classes. Uh, in a more, in a multi-class problem in a neural network, this is a more complex set of parameters, but uh, even so, the parameters uh, of the network, of the model, fully define what the net, the in, along with the architecture itself, fully define what the classifying, what the classifier does on any input. Right? And the way you actually solve such a problem is to, uh, in, is to use the data that you have 
to learn these, uh, learn these theta. This is what's called empirical risk minimization. So you actually uh, figure out what thetas will give you the best performance on the training set that you have. Right? And uh, so this becomes an optimization problem. Uh, usually the loss is some kind of a relaxation of the zero one loss that you care about, but uh, let's not worry about that for the moment. Uh, so the problem becomes, uh, I have some loss function associated with every single data point and every setting of parameters. I want to find the theta, which will minimize the average loss over all of my uh, training data. Uh, and I guess this is another setting where just adding noise doesn't make sense at all because uh, the models in these uh, neural setting are highly non-convex. They have large sensitivity, uh, so adding noise wouldn't work. Uh, what you would want to use uh, is the noise up the right objects paradigm. And one way to use that is to take our standard non-private algorithm for this problem and uh, add appropriate noise at the appropriate steps. And that's sort of what we'll uh, attempt. So the standard solution to this problem that people use in practice uh, is stochastic gradient descent. So this is like gradient descent that you probably all uh, hopefully remember from high school. You start at a random point, you compute the gradient of your loss function, and you follow, take a small step in the direction of the gradient. You keep doing that repeatedly. The gradient changes as you go along. This gives you a path. Uh, at the end of this, this process of doing gradient descent can only stop at a local minima. Uh, so if you do this long enough, you'll end up at one. Uh, in practice, what one actually does is instead of computing the gradient of the whole loss function, which requires you to take a pass over the whole data set, you use what's called stochastic gradient descent, which says, which is kind of the lazy version. It says, let me just pick a few random examples from my data set, compute the loss on those, and use the gradient on that loss uh, to take a small step. Okay. So this is a nice algorithm. It has a nice form for us. It has one single step, which, which is red. So, and this is computing an average of some vectors. So this is something we know how to sanitize. So let's do that. Let's apply the Gaussian mechanism uh, to this gradient descent step. And that gives you a differentially private algorithm uh, for doing gradient descent, for optimizing your theta. Uh, this does give you a finite epsilon, but not a very good one, mainly for the reason that uh, typically for large parameters, when you actually want to run this algorithm, the T is very large, like hundreds of thousands. Uh, so if you were to even use the strong composition theorem, uh, you end up with a very large privacy cost. So here, what comes to a rescue is, is, uh, is a theorem that uh, Guy alluded to earlier, uh, which is known as uh, privacy amplification by sampling. And this is the following kind of uh, not surprising at first and then surprising as you look deeper into it uh, kind of theorem. It says the following. You have a differentially private algorithm. Uh, and you take it and run it on a small sample of the data. You run it on a Q fraction of your data, picked at random. So this whole thing is now an algorithm that applies on your whole data set. It does two things. It first takes a sample and then applies this other algorithm, M. Uh, this whole algorithm is a lot more private. It's essentially Q epsilon times Q delta differentially private. So we've actually gained a lot of privacy uh, by running on a sample. Right? And I guess to some extent the reason it's surprising is that if you, uh, if you have a one differentially private algorithm, 
you run it on 1% of your data, uh, and then you run through the whole data set. So you take 100 steps. The final thing is, so each step is one over 100 differentially private, but strong composition scales not as t, but as square root t. So I can make a pass over the whole data set, uh, running a one differentially private algorithm at each step, and still the final thing is something like 0.1 differentially private. And I guess the reason this happens is that we are actually strongly exploiting the fact that the, this randomness is buying us some privacy and it's hidden from the adversary. If this was not a random Q fraction but a deterministic Q fraction, the theorem won't be true. Okay, so now we have a good algorithm, uh, a better way to analyze it. Now we can talk about uh, this whole step. I guess the sand should start here at this point. Uh, so this, the privacy cost of picking a small batch and then computing an average gradient is actually much smaller. And I can analyze this uh, using strong composition. Uh, this works, gives me somewhat reasonable bounds, uh, and using, I guess, uh, some relaxation of CDP or uh, ZCDP, uh, you can actually get even better bounds. Uh, and, uh, and I guess, yeah, using this sort of stronger composition theorem that we need to develop for this setting, you can actually get very reasonable bounds. Uh, what we do in practice is one additional step. You, we saw how to do PCA, so it actually helps to remove noise from your images before you start doing all of this. So as a first step, you compute a PCA of the data in a differentially private way, and then you do all of this on the PCA projected uh, data set. And this actually works uh, surprisingly well. So on this MNIST data set, which has about 50,000 images, uh, you get something like 95% accuracy uh, with two differential privacy. Uh, another interesting thing from this plot is that the testing and the training accuracy are actually very close to each other. And this is not an accident, this is a property of differentially private algorithms that uh, Aaron will uh, talk more about uh, in, his, in his talk. And I guess this idea of kind of running, of using kind of a noisy, adding noise to a, to a statistic computed on a small sample uh, has actually been useful not just in this example but in a large number of settings. So I guess it's, uh, it's almost time to call it a paradigm. Uh, there's been several papers recently in various, uh, for various tasks in machine learning such as topic modeling and variational inference where just using this approach actually gives very good results. So those were all the paradigms I'm going to talk about. I'll just mention some of the ones I didn't. Uh, so there's a sparse vector technique which is uh, enormously useful. Uh, there's the whole area of smooth sensitivity that uh, came up earlier. Uh, there's the sample and aggregate framework, and in fact, there's some recent work where you can uh, use that to do a privacy analysis that is data dependent. So where the privacy cost itself is a function of the data. Uh, and for the data that we actually care about, the privacy cost happens to be much, to be a lot less than uh, what you would uh, get in the worst case. Uh, and I guess then there's also the good old uh, roll up your sleeves approach which is to kind of design an algorithm that you intuitively feel should be differentially private and then prove that it has the privacy property that you, uh, that you expect. Uh, I also only talked about uh, what we call the global model of differential privacy. Uh, there's also a lot of work in some other models of differential privacy such as uh, local differential privacy where uh, there's no central curator uh, there's multi-party differential privacy where you have many different curators. There's privacy under continual observation uh, where the adversary can kind of uh, get answers uh, sequentially and even a stronger model where the adversary can even look into the execution of the algorithm. 
And there are also somewhat weaker privacy models where you don't guarantee privacy against uh, all possible perturbations, but only uh, ones that you expect uh, to see. So I guess that's sort of all I'm gonna say. So I'm hopefully I've given you a sampling of the various primitives and paradigms that have been useful in uh, differentially private algorithm design. Uh, a lot of the tasks that you want to do uh, are already feasible using differential privacy. Uh, and I guess if there's one takeaway, it's that just simple noise addition uh, does not work is not the same thing as saying differential privacy does not work. There's a lot of uh, interesting techniques out there uh, that go well beyond just plain noise addition. Uh, and I guess the area also has uh, deep connections to lots of uh, other fields of uh, study. I kind of, uh, I talked about one or two of them, geometry and discrepancy theory in the talk, but there's a lot more, so I'll just leave you with this uh, web of connections uh, and stop here.